Mark 5, verse 19 through 20. And if you could, um, Hank, just before you go, just drop me down just a hair in case I get excited. Thank you. Okay, so I am going to uh, pick up last week's message um, about sharing your story. And we're going to key off of this phenomenal, fantastic story of a man who unfortunately is probably known forever as the Gadarean demoniac. But he was only the Gadarean demoniac when Jesus met him. And he didn't remain the Gadarean demoniac. We know all of these people, unfortunately, by their past, but Jesus changed their stories. And so, obviously, our object today is not to study the Gadarean demoniac, but to use his example to inspire and encourage and remind you that you have a story, a wonderful story that the Lord wants you to share with others. So in Mark chapter 5, Jesus has gotten into a boat on the western shore of uh, Galilee, and he's traveled across the lake to the eastern shore. And on the eastern shore of Galilee is a land that stretches from as south as Jerusalem on the east side of the Jordan River, all the way up into um, Damascus. So it's a pretty good stretch of land. It's actually the the length from top to bottom of Israel itself, and it's called the Decapolis because there are 10 city-states, Gadara being one of them, where this man probably was from, hence we call him the Gadarean demoniac. But um, So that's important for you to know because of what happens to this man minutes after he meets Jesus. So Jesus gets out of the boat as they come to the shore, and out comes a madman who the Bible says has been living in the tombs. He's out of his mind. He's a wretched individual, tormented. He have fastened fetters and chains and yokes on him. He just snaps the chains. And he's so tormented, he screams among the tombs and he cuts himself with stones. This man, definitely um, in our kind of smart alecky way of talking today, we would say he doesn't have much of a life. And so uh, that would be an understatement. Um, He runs up and he falls at Jesus' feet and he says, I know who you are. Have you come to torment me before my time? And of course, the demons are speaking through him. And Jesus said, well, what's your name? And the demons speak and say, we are legion, for we are many. Now do you remember the story? We are legion. So um, Jesus is going to catch, the demons all, I love this part, the demons know that Jesus is going to cast them out because he's Jesus. So Jesus doesn't say, oh, I'm going to cast you out of that man. No, they know they're out. Just when you're walking with Jesus, when you're walking full of the Holy Spirit, you don't have to broadcast what you're going to do. That If there's any devils around, they know what you're going to do. Whenever Jesus is present, the demons have got to go. So they cry out. They said, are you going to, are you going to uh, cast us out? Don't cast us out of the country. Uh, and they said, there's a herd of swine. There were 2,000 pigs over there, and a big herd. Cast us into the pigs. And so Jesus did, and the whole herd ran violently off the cliff into the sea and were drowned. So you know that story. And the man was instantly set free, instantly delivered, and he's in his right mind. I mean, it is so miraculous that he is instantly calm, instantly able to speak and to think clearly. So Jesus delivers and heals him. And the man says to Jesus, I want to be one of your apostles. I want to go with you. Let me travel with you. Let Let me be with you. Jesus just gave this man his life. And so he wants to follow Jesus and uh, serve him. But listen to what Jesus said. We're going to begin in verse 19. Here we go. But Jesus said to him, listen carefully, go to your home, to your family, and to your friends, and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So two operative words here. Go and tell. 
Go tell friends, family, everybody, everything that the Lord has done for you. And so the Bible says he went away and he began to preach and proclaim in the ten towns of the Decapolis the great things Jesus had done for him and all were amazed. He was the first evangelist. The first evangelist moments before was a raving lunatic. He gets set free and he instantly is given his mandate. His mission is go tell friends, family, and everybody. So this guy takes it upon himself and he's traveling the north and south length of Israel all up and down the east side of the Jordan River preaching about Jesus. He doesn't have a Bible. New Testament hasn't been written. He's just telling what? What's he telling? He's telling his story. He's telling what Jesus did for him. I was a lunatic. I barely remember it. I met this man, Jesus. He must be the Messiah. He cast the de demons out of me. And as you can see, I am in my right mind. <clears throat> well, you have a story to tell. And your story, your story is the same. It is the story of God working in your life. It is not about your beliefs. Your story is about your experience. Your story isn't about your theology. Beliefs are important. Bible's important. Theology, important. It all has its place. But what you are commissioned to go tell is what God has done for you and what he is doing in you. That's your story. It's your experience. It's all about three things. It's about your realization. Your realization that Jesus really did rise from the dead because he is living in my heart. It's about your experience of God's love and healing and deliverance. And it's about your living. It's about your life living through amazing experiences of God's favor. In essence, your story is the real you. Now, a lot of Christians get saved and they wrestle sometimes for the rest of their life. Who am I? Am I really the person that the Lord saved? Am I that person that God began to work in? Or am I this person that has kind of dried out over the years and drifted and I'm kind of living a dual personality? Which one is my story? But Jesus gave this man, if you look again at how Jesus delivered him, the deliverance of the Gadarean demoniac didn't just change his life's story. It gave him a new mission in life. He didn't just receive a new mind and a new condition. He received a new mission. And so forevermore, his life was to go tell what Jesus had done for him. I want to call this the go tell mandate. Say that with me. The go tell mandate. Now, if Jesus has changed your story, if at some point he's come into your life and he's touched your life, he's changed your story, you, he's changed you from a sinner separated from God to a woman or a man who has access to our Heavenly Father, then he has also issued you a mandate to go and tell your story. Oftentimes, Christians rest, wrestle with, what is my purpose? Jesus made it so clear with the story of the Gadarene demoniac. Your purpose, go to your friends, your family, your neighbors, tell everybody how God has been good to you. Tell everything that God has done. That's your mandate, and it is going to take the rest of your life to do it. Now, it doesn't matter what your career is. It really doesn't matter if you're, if you're a professional soldier, if you're an airline pilot, if you work in a bank, if you're, if you're a nursery school teacher, if you work in the arts, or if you work in some form of culture, or you work in some industry. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that regardless of what your earthly occupation is, you have a mandate and a mission that through that, uh, that life that you are living, you are telling everyone your story. Telling your story. Again, you're not telling the theology of what you believe. You're telling the experience of what's happened in your life. And you have a responsibility. If the Lord has given you a story, it automatically compels you 
to be a teller of that story. I like in Psalm 107 too, a lot of you are probably familiar with this, really basically says the same thing. It says, let those delivered by the Lord speak out whom the Lord delivered with the power, with his power from their enemy. King James says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord has redeemed from the power of the enemy. So there you have it. If the Lord has redeemed you, your calling is tell that story. Well, <clears throat> you can't tell a story you don't have a grip on. You can't tell a story you haven't paid attention to. Do you know how many people don't pay attention to their own lives? That's why we have psychiatrists, psychologists, and you know they're out of touch with the reality of their own lives. And so it, the same thing happens to Christians. We get saved, we have experience with God, but we don't catalog those experiences. We don't think deeply about them. We don't think about what actually happened. We don't think about where it came from. We're just happy to experience the relief of it. You know, so we're, we're, we're just way too minimal about how we handle our own testimony. That's why when people are confronted with, you need to give your testimony, they start sweating because they don't know what to say. They have never sat down and really thought about their story. Yet, how could you not spend time, of all the things that you spend time doing, of all the trivia that you know, of all the details of things that you learn, above everything, you should learn your own story. You should not only learn your story, but you should live your story. Remember I said that your story is who you really are. So how do I do that? How do I go tell my family, my friends, and the world what Jesus has done for me? And most people begin by thinking, I need to go to Bible school. I need to learn all this stuff. Well, you do need to learn all this stuff. But it's not so that you can tell your story. It's so that you can know the mechanics of that story, the promises of God and how God's moved in your life. This is the backup that explains how it happens. But do you know how many Christians know this, but they cannot put into words what God has actually done for them? So you know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like going to college. I remember we, we pastored for five years on the campus of Yale University. We had a lot of Yale students, doctoral students. And can you imagine getting a doctoral degree from Yale University and then going out not knowing what to do with your life and doing nothing? That is what life is like for a lot of Christians. They come to church thousands of times. They learn all this stuff. And eventually, no wonder, Christians get tired. They get tired of going to church like, I just can't sit through another message. Where that comes from, we think it comes from, I just need a different church. This church is dull. Or, uh, I, you know, maybe this isn't all there is to life. But what it comes from, it comes from not paying attention to your own story. Not loving and appreciating the you that Jesus is molding and remaking. And getting acquainted with that person. And being obedient to tell people who you are according to what Jesus has done for you. So I call that live your story. How do I be the person that fills that mandate of go tell? I do it by living my story. Embrace and be the person. Listen, don't let Satan manipulate you into reducing Jesus down to mere beliefs. When you first got saved, Jesus was a person. And people, when they first get saved, they, said, they say things like, the Lord wrapped his arms around me, and they weep and they rejoice, and because it's real, it's a relationship. It's like first love, falling in love. But what happened to the Ephesian church in the book of Revelation? The Lord warned them. They were one of the most intelligent, well-taught, theologically deep and sound churches of their day. And yet he said, I warn you, you've lost your first love. We can get so consumed in polishing our lives that we forget how to talk about what God's done in our lives. Don't let Satan manipulate you into reducing Jesus from being a person to being a set of beliefs that you carry around. Don't let him deceive you into thinking that Jesus is just part of your life. That's what happens to Christians. Get saved, they're on fire for God, and then as time goes by, they don't 
tell their testimony. They don't talk to people about what the Lord's done in their life. And they begin to drift from that story. Their own story becomes like a faded movie that they barely can remember. And so what happens is they begin thinking that, well, Jesus is part of my life. He's not my whole life. But the truth is, Jesus is your life. Living outside of him is not life. Your story, as I said, it's not about your beliefs, but it's about experiencing God living in you. So when you live your story, when you get up every day, remember who you are, remember your testimony, God refreshes it and he makes, new, he makes that story to grow. Day by day, week by week, there's new experiences of God answering your prayers and showing you things and directing you, you know, because you're living with him on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you're living your story, it keeps you reverent towards the Lord. It keeps your faith fresh. It keeps your heart tender. Developing and telling your story plugs you into the Holy Spirit, and it generates faith and power because you're being a witness. You're giving evidence when you tell your story of Jesus working in you. And in the book of Acts, those early believers, when they were first launched out and telling their story all over the place, it says in that very first chapter in verse 8, Jesus said to them, you will receive power, ability, efficiency, might, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. What is a witness? It's one who tells their story from their perspective. It's great to be able to go out and say, I read a book about so-and-so. Isn't that a great story? But that's not your story. You need to tell your story. That's what being a witness is. And that is what the Holy Spirit will empower. We don't have the moving of the power of the Holy Spirit because we're not telling our story. We're telling someone else's story. It's okay to tell David, King David's story. It's okay to share about those experiences. But if you want to see the power, the efficiency, the ability of the Holy Spirit, start talking about what Jesus is doing in your life. That's what Jesus said. You'll be my witnesses. Think of Jesus on trial. Retro in retrospect, you are being the one who gives evidence. You really can't give evidence of what God did in Paul's life. You can't give evidence of what God did in Peter's life. You can only be the evidence of what Jesus is doing in your life. So many Christians are spending their whole lives talking about things they have no evidence of. It's true what God did in Paul's life, Peter's life. That's true. We can certainly talk about it, but that's not our story. That's not where our power comes from. Read the book of Acts. Read the story after the Gospel of John about what happened immediately after Jesus rose from the dead, how those first believers went out into all the world. It's not about them using Christian theology to overcome, overcome Jewish legalism or to permeate the Greco-Roman world. It's about people telling their stories of how Jesus set them free. That's all the book of Acts is. The great apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, laid out in detail the deep layers of theology about the new covenant and all of those brilliant things. When he went and preached, do you think that's what he preached? No. You can actually read it in the book of Acts. He talked about, he, I was on the Damascus Road and I saw a great light and I fell to the ground. I said, Lord, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. That is where the power of the Holy Ghost moved upon Paul's life. Paul was not a university or theology professor. He was a teller of his story. And so when you look in the book of Acts, that's what those people were doing. You see, theology explains the truth, but your story presents the evidence of the truth. You need to get to presenting the evidence of the truth, because that's what people in the world, that's what sinners need. Telling sinners what you believe will get you ignored. Have you experienced that? 
You try telling sinners, I believe this, and the Bible says that, guess what? You're going to get brushed aside. You will get ignored because they can't relate with that. They're blind. They can't see that. But telling them your story connects them with what they want for themselves. When you tell your story, guess what? They want the same thing in their life. It builds a bridge to their need. It builds a bridge to where they're at. It's so important that you learn to articulate your own story because that's where the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit will not only fill you to connect with people, but fill you with joy Amen. and overcoming power. Some of you have been fasting, praying, reading your Bible, knocking yourselves out. You've read 23 devotional books, and you're still waiting for revival. Do the one thing that will revive you. Tell your story. I will send the Holy Ghost so that you will be tellers of your story. Hallelujah. Now you say, well, it's supposed to be about Jesus. Show me Jesus without your story. Go ahead. Show me Jesus. I'd like to say, show me. What you're showing me is black and white letters on a page. Is it true? Of course it's true. But it makes no difference here in the world where we have to live, where we have to overcome the power of the enemy. Your story is the contact point. Hallelujah. It's the kinetic connection to the risen Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Your story about Jesus helps people who are deaf to the truth hear him knocking on their own heart's door. Reading Bible verses doesn't do that. Let me say to you this morning that Satan is fighting your story. Why is the devil after me? God, just to wish the truck, can I get a break? I just came out of one trial, I'm in another trial. Why is the devil after me? I'm not that important. See, that's your first problem, is you don't see your own importance. Why? Because you don't connect with your own story. The church doesn't need me. Other believers don't need me. God doesn't need me. Satan is fighting your story. You want to know why? He's trying to save sinners from you. You think he's trying to save sinners from Jesus. No. Because sinners can't contact Jesus. They can contact you. Come on. I know I'm preaching better than you're amening. So... Satan's trying to keep preachers, uh, keep sinners away from you. He's working hard to keep you from obeying Jesus' mandate to go tell your story. He's trying to disempower you and save sinners from your influence by turning you into what? See, he's not trying to get you to backslide. He's trying to get you to go to church. That's right. Satan would prefer that you just be a churchgoer. Just don't be one who goes and tells your story. Because sinners have nothing to fear from churchgoers. By turning you into a mere churchgoer, he saves sinners from your influence. Let me just ask this question at this point as we come down near the end of this message. Have you lost contact with your own story? Think about it. Maybe you've already been thinking about it, but think right now, take a moment. Have you lost contact? Have you lost touch with your own story, what Jesus has done for you? You know other people's stories. You've read their books. You've listened to them. You, you can tell their story better than you can tell your own because you don't think you have a story. That's how much you have ignored your own story. You don't even know that you have one. You haven't sat and thought. You need to recapture that story. Don't let Satan turn you into a, a mere churchgoer. Or you know what happens to Christians that lose touch with their story? They quit going to church and they become a secret believer. Jesus disintegrates into beliefs. There's no need for fellowship. And they just become a secret believer. They have a set of doctrines, a set of beliefs. Listen, this morning, 
Find the lies that Satan has quietly sown into your mind to lure you off track from your own story, to get you to think that, well, God really hasn't done anything in my life. Those kinds of things the enemy says to you so subtly. Maybe they're things he said to you years ago. And from that point on, you haven't realized it, but that was the dart he sent into your mind, the sharp thought that got stuck in the side of your head, maybe two or three like it, that caused you to think, God's not doing anything great for me. He hasn't done anything great in my life, but he has, you've ignored it, but it's there. You have a story. You need to uproot those lies. You need to cast them out and reconnect with your story. In Revelation chapter 12, we see the end times, and we see a chaotic world, the world that we're ramping up into today. And in chapter 12, verse 11, the Bible sees the believers who are overcomers, and it says of them this, they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Those who follow the mandate to tell their story will be the only ones who survive the day of the Antichrist. We are, we're entering the day of the Antichrist. The Antichrist has risen. He's seized governmental power all over the face of the earth. He's gobbling up institutions. The truth is falling prostate where people are not truly walking in the truth. They're giving up whatever vestiges they have. Look around you. Wake up. And look at what's happening. The spirit of Antichrist. The Antichrist is obviously not here yet, but the spirit of Antichrist, the precursor, is moving upon us. If you are going to survive the world you're in today, you better get hold of your story and start telling it. Because the Bible says those that overcome do so by the blood, the grace of Jesus, and the word of their story. I had asked earlier kind of the academic question, well, how do I do this? How do I live my story? How do I be a teller of my story? In the small little one chapter book of Philemon in verse six, it says that the communicating of your faith may become effective by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Jesus Christ. So look carefully at what is said in that verse. The communicating of your faith will become effective, powerful, when you start acknowledging every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Do you know what that means, acknowledging every, Telling your story. Even if you have to start by telling it to yourself. Turn on your computer, microphone, start telling your story to yourself. Start telling, rehearse your story, what God has done with you. The more you do it, the more the communicating of your faith will become effective. By the regular communicating of telling your story, you are continuously reviving every good thing that God has done, done in you. I guarantee you the scales work like this. You stop telling your story, and the things, the good things that God's doing in you start disappearing. They start vanishing. Go back to telling your story, they start reemerging and become renewed in you. So stop waiting for revival. Just obey Jesus' mandate to go tell your story and watch revival come. You are one pent-up revival waiting to explode. 